Let's bring in Labor MP and Chair of the Standing Committee on Economics, Daniel Molino. Thanks for your time, Daniel Molino. The, the number today, broadly in line with expectations, but inflation is stubborn. Will the RBA move again next week? Well, obviously, you know, it's, it's extremely difficult to know what the independent RBA will do. It, it, it looks at a whole range of numbers, and this is just one of a number of figures uh, that are coming out. But, look, I think that it's, as the Treasurer said, we certainly welcome the fact that the trend in the inflation numbers, both the headline numbers and also the underlying numbers, is downwards. And that's exactly what we wanted to see. Um, as in line with the uh, forecasts of the government, the, it looks as though inflation peaked in the final quarter of last year. And so now what we'd like to see uh, is that, based on uh, monetary and fiscal policy working together, uh, inflation uh, coming down over the course of this year and next year. While it's coming down, it is only very gradual, isn't it? Well, look, I think all forecasters, whether it be the government, Treasury, whether it be the RBA or indeed the private forecasters, had all uh, indicated that they expected that it would take some time. And that's the nature of uh, economies. It, it, what, you, you don't see inflation uh, at these kinds of levels come down overnight. That was not what anybody forecast uh, or expected. What we're really trying to achieve uh, is for inflation to come down in an orderly way and in a way where we can provide uh, relief to people along the way in a way that doesn't add to inflationary pressures. And that goes back to the Treasurer's overarching economic plan, is that uh, the government provide targeted relief to people in a way that doesn't make the RBA's job harder, that doesn't add to inflation, that we deal with some mm. of the supply chain and other supply side issues in the economy, um, and that we make the economy more resilient going forward. Uh, it was always going to take a year or two for this kind of inflation to unwind. What you want to do is to help people along that journey as much as you can. Yes, yeah, so that's, that's the question I want to ask you, Daniel Molino. When, when you're talking about not being inflationary, can an increase in, in uh, the, the job seeker payment be made, for example, while still not driving any sort of inflationary impact? Well, look, I, th I think that what we need to remember when it comes to some of the discussion around job seeker payments that we've been seeing over the last, you know, few days and, and longer is that there are many tools in the government's toolkit. And indeed, even if we look at that inclusion report, there were 37 reports, 37 recommendations in that report, and they dealt with a whole raft of things. They dealt with embedding full employment more uh, deeply in a range of government targets and, and uh, government frameworks. And we've already seen some action on that part by uh, the government in its response to the uh, re review of the RBA, for example. Um, there's also a range of recommendations when it comes to place-based initiatives to help uh, get vulnerable people into employment. So there's a whole raft of recommendations in there, uh, many of which dovetail with other initiatives that the government is undertaking. Um, now, of course, the uh, one recommendation in relation to JobSeeker um, has taken up a lot of uh, airtime over the last few days, but I think it's really worth remembering uh, that the government is taking action on a whole range of fronts. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I would say is that when it comes to giving relief to people, uh, again, there are a number of tools in the toolkit and the, the Treasurer has indicated that the government, as part of the budget process, is actively considering uh, a range of measures that will give people uh, relief from cost of living pressures. So um, I, yeah. I think it's absolutely imperative that we take into account the fact that people are doing it tough, uh, that that isn't the only lever that we have to pull. But can, can it be increased without having an inflationary impact if, say, the government does spend less elsewhere? Well, look, I think what you need to do is I think you need to look at the suite of measures. Um, I, I wouldn't want to... Uh, you know, look at job seeker in isolation as if we're just making a decision on that front alone. Um, one of the measures that you want to look at when it comes to uh, helping people deal with cost of living uh, pressures is getting people into jobs. That's one of the very best ways mm -hmm. in which we can uh, help people deal with cost of living pressures. So keeping in, uh, unemployment as low as possible over the course of the next 12 to 24 months mm -hmm. is an absolutely key measure. Another key measure that we need to think about is uh, wages growth. Um, so we index all of our benefits as we should. We index the unemployment benefit. We 
index, uh, DSS payments and the pension, but we also need to make sure that we're dealing with uh, wages growth, especially uh, at, at the bottom end. And then, of course, there are yeah. um, tools that we have to use when it comes to uh, payments. And, and so I think job seek is one of them, but there are also other means uh, that you have to use, like uh, payments when it comes to energy prices, for example. So um, I would say that you need to look at this in a holistic way. Uh, and job seeker is one option, but it's not the only option to provide assistance to people sure. who are doing it tough. Yeah, that's true. But there, there is this open letter today signed by uh, a few hundred people, including four of your Labor colleagues, who are saying that, quite simply, $49 a day is not enough, that people, far too many of those people are living a long way below the poverty line because of the, the nature of that payment. And as I say, that includes four of your colleagues, Michelle Anandaraja, Alicia Payne, Louise Miller-Frost and Kate Thwaites. They've, they've all signed that letter. Oh, no, and I can totally understand where they're coming from and they would be receiving... Uh people's commentary from their electorates, uh, just as I am. Um, I mean, I totally get where they're coming from. I, I guess I would simply try to stress that um, the way I view the government's overarching response to this is that, um, you know, one option would be to look at that payment, but th there, there are other ways to deal with the full range of people who are dealing with cost of living uh, pressures. And as I said, you know, part of that is about how we manage the unemployment rate and under underemployment, it's wages growth. But it's also about, within the payment system, JobKeeper's one option, but there are other, other ways in which we can help households who might have particular cost okay. pressures they're dealing with, such as energy. And I, I'd, I'd hope that the budget well, process will be the, on, looking at that let me ask range you, of responses. Let me ask you about the energy front before you go. Just last question. The cap on prices for the compulsory code of conduct in the gas industry, it's going out to 2025 now. Why is it necessary? Well, look, we saw in uh, the, the current inflation figures that uh, gas was a component in what was driving up inflation in the last quarter. A lot of the pressures on the energy side uh, haven't gone away. And so it is important that we continue to see government taking uh, appropriate action when it comes to uh, the impact of energy uh, on people's cost of living. Um, so, look, what I would... Uh, hope we continue to see is that government take measured responses which put downward pressure on wholesale prices and what the government's done to date has put real downward pressure on wholesale gas and uh, coal prices and we've seen them fall by almost 50 per cent. Um, but we also need to make sure that government puts in place appropriate frameworks to ensure that there's uh, ongoing investment in, in both the generation yeah. side in, in more supply on the gas side and, and the way that's distributed throughout the economy to industry and households. So, uh, it remains a source okay. of inflationary pressure and that's why government action is absolutely critical. And that's why the opposition, in just voting against anything the government's put forward, for example, when we called Parliament back late last year, is showing that they have no ideas in this space. Um, and all, all they're good at is basically throwing rocks at whatever it is the government puts forward. Daniel Molino, Chair of the Standing Committee on Economics, thanks. Thanks, Kieran.